Hello and welcome. This short PowerPoint and presentation is intended for teachers who are preparing to teach about the topic of Native America and genocide. Now, because this is such a big, complicated, and often very intimidating subject to teach about, rather than trying to cover everything in any detail, I've instead chosen to provide you with a number of suggestions, um, as well as an overview of some of the most important themes and areas that you may want to consider addressing, as well as a few specific examples and case studies um, to give a little more detail and context. I've also provided at the end of the PowerPoint a number of readings that you can um, follow up on if you want to go into more detail and depth in preparing to approach this topic. My name's Alex Alvarez, and I'm a professor in the Department of Criminology and Criminal Justice at Northern Arizona University up in Flagstaff. The reason why I'm giving this presentation is because I'm someone who has written about, studied, presented on genocide in particular for a large number of years. And this presentation is in large part based upon the work that I've done in this area. Now, a question you may be asking yourself is why even teach about this issue? And I would argue that there are a number of important and interrelated reasons why this is an important topic that we absolutely need to be teaching about. The first is that it is very relevant, especially given where we live here in Arizona, in the American Southwest. Arizona is home to 21 different tribal groups and with a population of almost 300,000 native peoples here in the state, it is something that is very close to home. Um, it is also very timely. And what I mean by that is it feels like we are, as a nation, for the first time, a bit more honestly confronting some of our history. Think about all of the debates and controversies um, that um, have centered around in recent years, the issue of slavery, the lost cause, the Civil War. Well, in many ways, this is a similar kind of process that concerns uh, our history relative to the indigenous peoples of the Americas, where we are taking a closer, harder look at the violence, the destruction and trauma and genocide that all too often accompanied um, the creation and development of the United States. It's also very, very current. And what I mean by that is that Native American issues are in the news um, quite frequently. Think about um, the protests around the Dakota Access Pipeline, for example. And as we'll talk about later on, the legacy of colonialism, for example, is something that we find is still very much with us. The issues that you will be talking about and presenting about are not just from the past, but are still very much with us today. And last, I would argue that teaching about Native America and genocide expands our understanding of the ways in which prejudice and intolerance allow the perpetration of extreme violence, of destruction, both physical and cultural. Um, and for all of these different reasons, uh, teaching about Native America and genocide is something that we need to really um, foster in a real thoughtful kind of way. Now, when approaching this topic and teaching about this topic, I would encourage all of you to um, be very careful and considerate and respectful in terms of how you talk about these issues. Think about it this way. What you're really talking about in uh, a very real sense is about human beings who experience tremendous harm, trauma, suffering, and violence. And in many native communities, these issues are still very real, very much alive. Um, that this is not something just from the long ago past, but it is about um, ancestors, family members, relatives, community members, 
Um, and so we always need to strive um, to be as considerate, as careful, and as respectful as possible. I would encourage all of you to be as historically accurate as you can um, when you're approaching this topic. And now, I realize this is something teachers strive to do generally, but I do really want to highlight it. Given how complicated this topic is, how much of it there is out there, uh, and how sensitive it is, I think there's oftentimes a tendency to want to, to, want to oversimplify this um, into um, straightforward or clear-cut or easily understood narratives or case studies um, for our students' benefit. The problem with that is that we lose some of the reality, some of the complexity um, that marked what really occurred. And instead of staying away from the complexity, I would encourage you to embrace it, to raise the challenges, the um, controversies and discussions and um, the cross currents that marked um, the history of this nation. It gives a more accurate understanding of what occurred and it also um, helps us derive more realistic, more true kinds of lessons um, from those um, uh, modules. I would also encourage you to avoid um, simply uh, creating false equivalencies between different cases of genocide. Now, while many genocides do share some important qualities um, that we can highlight to illustrate some common themes, it's also true that not all genocides are the same, that they occur in many different ways with different methodologies, um, and that those differences are sometimes just as important as, as any common um, qualities they share. So, make sure that when you make comparisons that you do so in as thoughtful um, a way as possible. So how do you deal with this complexity, with these differences and so forth? What I would encourage you to think about is rather than trying to cover everything or, or providing a, a, you know, a complete overview of all of the topics, Rather, focus in on more specific kinds of examples, specific issues, specific topics, as I will uh, illustrate um, a little bit later in this presentation. So in instead of giving a huge overview, perhaps just touch upon specific illustrations that you can dig deep into. I do want to mention a, a quick note about terminology. Generally speaking, the word Indian alone is discouraged. Um, however, native and indigenous um, are terms that are becoming more popular and are generally acceptable. Uh, American Indian and Native American are also broadly acceptable and in fact are often considered to be uh, synonymous, although Native American is sometimes considered to be a bit broader in terms of the various groups that it includes. Um, not everyone necessarily agrees with these terms. There are those who have different preferences and so forth, but generally speaking, these are terms that are um, fairly widespread and fairly acceptable. Now, in other countries, if you are doing any kind of comparisons, uh, so for example, uh, exploring some of the issues in Canada or Australia, two countries in which, uh, for example, residential boarding school systems are often compared to that in the US, um, different terms are generally used more frequently. So for example, in Canada, the terms First Nations is um, most typically um, employed. Australia, the word Aboriginal is very common. Now, even those terms are not necessarily the most perfect, the ones I just reviewed, but um, when at all possible, it's generally considered preferable to use the name of specific tribes um, instead of these bigger umbrella terms. Now, it's not perfect. Um, in fact, some of the names for different tribal groups that your students or which you may be most familiar with are oftentimes terms that were given to those groups um, by enemies. And so I have a few examples here on this slide of some of those. So for example, the word Sioux um, 
it is the Chippewa word for snake. So not necessarily um, the most ideal term to use. Now, one strategy you could adopt would be to rely on the name that individual tribal groups use for themselves. Uh, typically, this tends to be some variation of human being, the people, the real people, something along those lines. Uh, an example close to home here um, would be when we consider the largest tribal groups here in Arizona are the Navajo, um, a term that is widely used and generally acceptable. Um, however, we also know that the term that the Navajo use for themselves um, is the Diné, which means the people. Teaching about Native American genocide, as important and as timely and relevant as it is, is a bit trickier than it might initially seem. And I think part of the reason for that is as awareness and attention and use of the word genocide has become much more common and widespread, um, it has also become increasingly political and emotional. In many ways, the word genocide has come to represent the apex um, of absolute evil of the worst possible fate that can befall a population. Um, it is sometimes referred to as the supreme crime or the crime of all crimes, that kind of thing. We also need to understand that the word genocide, um, even though it has an official definition, the word is used differently by different people for different purposes. So if you're an international rights lawyer or a scholar or an activist, you may be using it in different kinds of ways with different goals in mind. An international lawyer is using it for legal purposes. A scholar is using it for analytical reasons. Um, and an activist might be um, uh, calling attention to some atrocity being perpetrated by a group they belong to or care about. Um, or others might simply be trying to call attention to some issue that they feel strongly about and trying to mobilize um, attention, that kind of thing. But at the end of it, um, the thing to remember is uh, as you talk about these issues, as you debate um, how we use the word genocide and so forth, um, it, remember that it should never be intended to minimize, dismiss, or otherwise discount the harm, the tragedy, the trauma of the um, topics that you are dealing about and the groups that you are um, studying. Applying the word genocide can also be a little bit tricky because of the limitations of the word itself. Let's remember that the word genocide, um, its origination, its conceptualization, and then especially its codification into international law was profoundly influenced by one particular example of genocide, the Holocaust. It was also created with particular um, goals in mind, legal goals. Now, not every example of genocide falls in neatly or easily into the um, template or model provided by the Holocaust. And the fact that it was created for the legal purposes of prevention and intervention means that it privileges certain ideas, certain kinds of things that also sometimes make it kind of hard to apply it to real world examples. Courts still struggle with using the word genocide in um, contemporary examples of mass atrocity crimes, uh, let alone historic examples. Um, it makes it difficult um, because in some ways, um, legal purposes want um, identifiable perpetrator groups um, in order to hold responsible, right? And so in the cases of genocide, are we talking about state perpetrators? Are we talking about private groups? Um, what if we're talking about the structural arrangements um, that um, will find marked colonialism? As, and we'll talk about that issue in a few minutes.
Um, if we're talking about state perpetrators, which state are we talking about? Are we talking about the British, the French, the Spanish? Um, if we're talking about the later American government, um, are we talking about it in toto or are we talking about a particular moment in time? Um, which tribe? Um, the, um, the Americas were filled with many different tribal groups that pursued different strategies. So the idea about genocide as conceptualized seems to suggest a particular event or a particular um, perpetrator group. And, and the real world um, is sometimes a little more tricky than that. In recent years, it's become fairly common to speak of Native America and genocide in these very broad, general, all-encompassing kinds of ways. But I would discourage approaching this topic in terms of teaching it, um, I would discourage that. Is it possible to speak of a genocide as in a, an event, when we know that experiences varied tremendously uh, by tribal group, by the time period we're talking about, by the location, um, and by the ability and the willingness of individual tribal groups to accommodate, to resist, to adapt, to negotiate, uh, and, and so forth. The problem of oversimplifying um, and speaking of a overarching genocide um, as if it was all one event, um, it, it falls into the trap of treating Native people as simply having been helpless and, and passive. Um, and in that sense, it also essentializes them as all being the same and does not recognize the diversity of tribal groups, nor the agency and autonomy um, and the various strategies that they used, that they employed at different places and in different points and times. It also does a disservice by stereotyping Native peoples as simply having been victims, as if this is what defines the various Native populations. Um, it ignores the resiliency, uh, the creativity, the um, survival of these populations. So I would encourage you to avoid speaking of a genocide in this overly broad, oversimplifying kind of way. Um, instead, I would encourage you to be specific to particular examples or particular issues that highlight genocide um, or a, a particular case study of genocidal violence. And unfortunately, there are all too many examples that you could choose to draw from in order to teach about this subject. One issue that is very often brought up within the context of Native American genocide is that of disease. Uh, evidence shows that anywhere from 80 to 90 some odd percent of the population living in the Americas prior to contact uh, died from the various diseases and various epidemic that raged through the continent over the, a period of many, many years. Um, entire civilizations and cultures that had been around for thousands of years were wiped out. And it's hard to overstate the extent uh, and tragedy of the loss of life and the loss of diversity, of culture, of tradition, of entire peoples that simply ceased to exist um, over the course of these diseases. Um, there were some reasons for the high transmission rates um, and mortality rates of these diseases, um, including things like a lack of natural resistance and especially a lack of acquired immunity. Um, but essentially, we know that disease was the single biggest killer uh, in the Americas. We know that disease played a tremendous role in facilitating the settlement, expansion, conquest of European colonial powers into the Americas. It depopulated vast tracts of land. It threw surviving tribal groups and individuals into disarray. Um, it destroyed cultures. Uh, it simply made 
the arrival and settlement and expansion easier. And so the question that you can ask um, is whether or not the death from disease can constitute genocide. Now, as with so many things, this can be a complicated um, issue. Uh, remember, we talked a little bit about the issue of intentionality and the meaning of the word genocide. Um, and, you know, so we have to ask the question of accidental infection versus intentional. And there are plenty of examples um, to highlight that. However, in terms of teaching this issue, um, it is possible to focus on a, par a few particular cases um, where there is evidence of at least uh, intentional infection um, of native populations. Um, perhaps the most infamous of that concerns uh, Jeffrey Amherst, who was the British commander of the British forces in the 1760s, who in sending a, a, a detachment of troops to relieve a besieged fort further west, um, exchanged letters with the commander of that detachment, speculating as to whether or not um, smallpox infected blankets could be um, disseminated to the native um, population. Uh, in a series of letters back and forth, uh, genocidal intention um, was very clearly uh, manifested in those letters. Now, unbeknownst to both Amherst and Colonel Bouquet, the head of the detachment going to relieve the fort, um, the uh, commander in the fort itself that was under siege actually did so on his own initiative in terms of passing on those smallpox um, infected blankets. Um, coincidentally, smallpox had actually just earlier broken out in that region um, to further complicate the issue. But what we see from this horrific um, example is at the very least a very clear genocidal intention to sow disease um, among native peoples at a time when the um, lethality of smallpox to native peoples had been fairly well established. Now, one school of thought that has gained a lot of attention in recent years among those who study the issue of Native America and genocide is that which uh, links colonialism and genocide. Now, it should be noted that there are a number of different kinds of colonialism and the type that is usually the one um, that is the focus of attention here is of settler colonialism with advocates for this position arguing that settler colonialism is inherently genocidal. The reason for that is because settler colonialism is all about destroying, removing, in order to replace and reshape. Settler colonialism is not just about um, going into a territory in order to exploit resources, but it's also about bringing in people to settle, um, to remove those who were there first, and to rebuild um, that territory in the image of the home territory, the home country from which those settlers came. It is about um, destroying in order to replace. And as such, um, it, it sees native people usually as a population that can be exploited, at least in the short term, um, but in the long run to be removed, um, either destroyed or displaced. And because of that, um, the argument is that genocide was Now, this idea of settler colonialism as being inherently genocidal is, I think, a very powerful argument. And I think it's one of the most important developments in the scholarship of this topic um, that has come out in recent years. But I also think we need to acknowledge that it changes our understanding and the meaning of the word. According to the official definition of genocide, the focus is on the intention. There has to be genocidal intention to start.
But the thing about settler colonialism and this literature that is uh, emerging is that um, the focus is more on the outcome rather than on the intent. It is more about certain structural arrangements than on whether or not there was any kind of specific plan to destroy a population. Aside from disease and aside from settler colonialism, another issue that can be explored um, in the context of Native America and genocide concerns some of the massacres that were an all too frequent hallmark of this history. Um, there are uh, um, a fair number of these, perhaps one of those that is, I think, a good case study that can be used to explore this issue and especially illustrating some of the underlying intention, ideology, um, as well as contradictions, um, is that which occurred at Sand Creek in 1864. The Sand Creek Massacre was carried out against a peaceful group of Southern Cheyenne and Arapaho who, who were in camp for the winter um, at Sand Creek. The leader of the Southern Cheyenne was an individual by the name of Black Creek, and he had led this band um, to Fort Lyon earlier that fall um, to escape the fighting that had been raging on the plains for much of the previous year. Now, the military at Fort Lyons were not able to officially accept his surrender, um, nor provide supplies. So they had told um, Chief Black Kettle um, and his followers to go to Sand Creek to spend the winter there, but to consider themselves under the protection of the U.S. military. The High Plains uh, in the middle of winter can be brutal. Um, so the reason why Sand Creek was chosen, it, it was a traditional wintering area because the banks of this wide, dry riverbed provided some shelter from the wind. Um, it was treed um, somewhat, so there was firewood there, and there were a number of springs that flowed year-round, so it was a place you could also get um, water. It wasn't that far from various hunting grounds, so it was an ideal location that um, Chief Black Kettle and his mixed band um, went to spend the winter in, believing themselves to be the, under the protection of the U.S. military. The man responsible for the massacre at Sand Creek was Colonel John Shivington, whose nickname the Fighting Parson had been given to him because previous to becoming a soldier, he had been a Methodist minister. He was the commander of around 700 troopers of the 3rd Colorado Cavalry, a volunteer unit, um, and one that had been excoriated in the Denver press as the bloodless third, because during much of the previous year, when there was a lot of fighting going on, um, they had spent their time going from bar to bar um, in Denver and had not engaged in any of the fighting. He was a confirmed racist to the core and advocated the eradication of all Native Americans. He's the individual who once um, was asked why he advocated for the killing of women and children um, and then described in the most dehumanizing of terms um, by suggesting that nits grow into lice. He's the one who was responsible for this massacre um, in every way. He easily could have taken his troopers much further north and east where the fighting was actually going on, but instead chose to attack this peaceful encampment, um, evidently thinking that not only did it have the advantage of being safer for he and his troopers, but that um, it didn't matter which encampment, which natives you attacked. The massacre at Sand Creek um, was perpetrated on early in the morning of November 29th, 1864. Um, the troopers essentially showed up at the edge of the encampment, uh, at the edge of Sand Creek, um, before being deployed and then charging um, into uh, attack um, and opening fire uh, almost immediately. As it quickly became clear that they were under attack, um, 
most of the women and children started fleeing away from the charging soldiers. Chief Black Kettle, um, he stood by his lodge waving an American flag, trying to gather his um, people around him at the same time signaling to the soldiers that they run to the protection of the military. But once he realized the futility of his actions, um, he also then fled. White Antelope, who was another prominent uh, leader of the Cheyenne, um, he actually walked towards the approaching soldiers with his arms in the air, evidently signaling to them that um, this was not a hostile uh, encampment. <clears throat> and then he stopped and stood with his arms folded across his chest in the middle of the dry riverbed in the path of the advancing soldiers. For his courage, he was simply shot down and killed and his body was then subsequently mutilated after the massacre was over. Most of the victims were women and children, as most of the young men were actually away from the encampment out on a hunting trip. Eyewitness accounts um, record some pretty horrific um, atrocities that were perpetrated. Um, many of the soldiers made a sport or a game out of shooting fleeing children after the shooting ended, many of the troopers subsequently mutilated many of the bodies of the women and those who, uh, the men who had been killed, subsequently displaying those body parts um, as trophies and souvenirs of this action. Chief Black Kettle survived this massacre only to be killed um, a number of years later at another massacre um, on the banks of the Washita River. Now, not all of the troopers under Shivington's command um, participated in the massacre. In fact, on the march out from Denver, um, once they found out his plans, um, some of the officers actually protested to um, Shivington that this amounted to murder, that these um, Native Americans were under a flag of truce, um, and for their pains, they had been roundly uh, sworn at by Shivington, who had said he had come to kill Indians and that's what they were going to do, and that they better not stand in his way. Now, Silas Sewell, Captain Sewell, um, was one of those who had protested and when they had been ordered to attack, um, he essentially led those troops under his command um, to the side where they simply sat and became bystanders to the massacre. Captain Sewell subsequently testified at uh, a number of inquiries um, against his former commanding officer. So what was the reaction to the massacre? Now here's where things get a little bit um, complicated, but in a way I think that reveals some of the issues uh, around genocide. So at the local level, in the Colorado Territory where a lot of the fighting had been taking place, where there was a lot of fear and anxiety, um, the actions of Shivington and his men was absolutely condoned, justified, seen as being completely legitimate. Um, Shivington himself, before going into this massacre, had encouraged his men with um, a reminder of the fighting that had been taking place. He told his men to remember our murdered women and children, um, referring to a number of families that had been killed um, in this previous year's fighting. So at the local level, absolutely, you can argue um, that there was a lot of genocidal um, ideology and intention in supporting the actions of Shivington and his men. At the national level, however, um, it was quite the opposite. Um, when news of the massacre came out, um, aided and abetted, in fact, by Captain Silas Sewell and others who wrote letters to um, their other leaders, to um, politicians, urging for the prosecution of Shivington. Um, this national um, outrage, if you will, um, resulted in a number of military and congressional inquiries um, that excoriated 
the massacre and Shivington in particular, his military career was ruined, although he never did serve any um, time for um, carrying out this um, appalling atrocity. So with the Sand Creek Massacre, what we see is um, a lot of support for genocide, for genocidal violence by Shivington, many of his men, not all of them, um, but also largely the settler population in the Colorado Territory. We need to remember that um, popular imagery in local newspapers and in um, print media were often filled with uh, imagery of native violence um, and depredations, especially against white women and children. Fear and anxiety were uh, very high levels out on the frontier over the past year because of the violence, because of the fighting. This is something we see quite frequently in many examples of genocide, where you have the popular imagery that fosters certain dehumanizing stereotypes um, and, and um, a sense of threat and danger um, that is then exploited by individuals in pursuit of their own um, goals, agendas, belief systems, and so forth. Arguably one of the most straightforward and clear-cut examples of genocide against Native peoples occurred in California in the wake of the discovery of gold in 1849. That discovery led to a massive population influx as people flooded into the territory in search of fortunes um, and in the process creating towns, communities, mining camps, and so forth throughout the territory and in places where there had previously not been um, a non-native presence at all. Not surprisingly, conflict between these newcomers and the native populations became increasingly common. Um, not only were they in territory where they had not been previously, but many of the newcomers began claiming large um, swaths of land. Um, they also, in the mining processes, often polluted rivers. Um, they also destroyed food sources. Uh, and so increasingly, um, tension, fighting, um, and violence began breaking out between these um, newcomers and the indigenous peoples um, of the California Territory. As conflicts increased, as tensions mounted, as sporadic acts of violence um, began happening with ever more frequency, what began happening is that in many of these newly created communities and settlements and mining camps and so forth, individuals, but increasingly informal and semi-formal groups began forming and going out and hunting and killing any individual natives they came across, but also sometimes organizing outright massacres where entire settlements and camps um, were surrounded and then um, killed. Now, initially, most of these were acting purely at the local level, but over time, they began receiving increasing amounts of support from the territorial and then state leaders who began reimbursing members of some of these groups for the ammunition they expended, for example, or also um, in some cases paying bounties for every native person that was killed, um, regardless of age or sex or anything like that. Another specific issue that you could explore with students concerns forced displacement, um, also sometimes referred to as ethnic cleansing. It is about through the use of terror and violence and intimidation and fear, um, removing a population from a particular territory. The most well-known example of this that many of you may well be familiar with um, concerns the Trail of Tears. But another case, a little less well known, but one that is a bit closer and more relevant um, here in Arizona, concerns the Long Walk. Um, 
The Long Walk refers to the forced displacement or the ethnic cleansing experienced by the Diné or the Navajo um, in the 1860s. Essentially, the U.S. military had decided to relocate the Navajo from their traditional homeland um, to New Mexico. And the strategy that they employed to do so was through this campaign of violence and terror and of um, destroying the means to survive as a population. They did so by raids into Navajo territory in which they would burn crops and fields. They would destroy the Hogan's, the traditional homes. Um, they cut down the trees and orchard that were um, food supplies and firewood. Um, they also killed or captured livestock. Uh, they even destroyed the pots um, that were used to hold food or transport water and so forth. Um, water supplies were poisoned or guarded. Um, essentially, it was all about terrorizing and destroying the ability of the Diné to survive in their traditional homeland. So over the next few years, increasing numbers of Navajo surrendered, and they were then transported, um, marched, uh, through a number of different means, hundreds of miles, um, to the Bosque Redondo um, by Fort Sumner in New Mexico. Along the way, many of them were subjected to outright murder, uh, rape, assault, theft, um, and various other kinds of uh, atrocities. The Long Walk is an example of genocidal violence, um, one that here in Arizona um, is particularly close to home. One other area that could be explored with students in regards to Native American genocide concerns the issue of what is sometimes referred to as the ethnocide, but is perhaps better known as cultural genocide. Cultural genocide is about the destruction of the ties that make a people a people. Culture is all about identity. And so cultural genocide is about destroying the bonds that unite a people, that connect the a people, that make them a people, whether it's about language or traditions or history or shared practices, uh, belief systems, all those things that go into a culture. Cultural genocide targets that rather than targeting the individual's physical um, self. In the late 1800s, the U.S. government began pursuing a different policy in regards to Native America. Specifically, they adopted a policy of forcible assimilation or forced assimilation. The vehicle for that forced assimilation were to be these Native boarding schools that were created in various parts around the country. The philosophy of these boarding schools was once summed up by the founder of the system, a Colonel Henry Pratt, um, who once um, in a speech noted that they were going to kill the Indian in order to save the man. This system of forced assimilation is perhaps a, a, one of the clearest examples of what is known as cultural genocide. It could also be noted that this kind of forced assimilation was not just a policy adopted in the United States, um, but um, was also something that became part of policy um, in Canada against the four, uh, First Nations, as well as in Australia um, with the Aboriginal population there. Um, it should also be noted that many of these schools were also um, noted for some of the um, abuses, um, assaults, and other forms of violence inflicted upon these vulnerable um, young individuals who were subjected to the experience of the schools. So I realize this has been a lot of material for you and I hope it's not been too overwhelming um, for you, but I thought what I would do at this point is just provide um, a few examples of a few readings that you could um, Take a look at if you wanted to deepen your own understanding of some of these topics and themes that I've only just briefly touched upon in this presentation. 
Um, one of them, for example, um, is a book I wrote a, a few years ago um, that I have here, um, and it deals with some of the issues that we've touched upon in this previous um, PowerPoint, um, but in a lot more detail, um, explaining in much greater length all of the different kind of things that we really only had uh, the opportunity to, to briefly um, touch upon. Um, a very good work, um, an award-winning book um, from Benjamin Madley, um, concerns the uh, Native American populations in um, California. And it is a, a very powerful um, and detailed history of that experience with genocide. For those looking for an in-depth and uh, very recent publication, looking at a big overview picture um, would be Jeffrey Osler's Surviving Genocide, Native Nations and the United States from the American Revolution to Bleeding Kansas. Um, Another take, a little more um, focused, would be Gary Clayton Anderson's book, Ethnic Cleansing and the Indian, The Crime That Should Haunt America. Now, this scholar of this topic um, makes a provocative argument. You may not agree with it, but what he argues is that um, genocide is not the best conceptual framework within which to explain much of what occurred um, post-contact but rather the term ethnic cleansing is a more appropriate lens through which we can um, look at this history. For those looking for a little more um, reading on the issue of colonialism, and especially in regards to an international context, not just the United States, um, but Canada as well. Um, I would recommend um, Wolford Benvenuto's and Hitton's excellent edited volume, Colonial Genocide in Indigenous North America. Um, many of the contributors to this are Canadian scholars who bring in First Nations kinds of issues. And so it gives you a, perhaps a, a, a more international um, and comparative approach to exploring this particular issue. Now, uh, some colleagues of mine, Marianne Nielsen and Linda Robine, um, recently um, put together a book, Colonialism is Crime. And what is nice about this volume is that it not only looks at historic issues, but it also examines contemporary issues of colonialism and um, Native America, so that you can make connections with some of the historic themes and issues, but then also how much of that is playing out um, in the contemporary world today. So in closing, um, thank you for listening to this presentation. I certainly hope you have found it not only interesting, but useful um, as a starting off point. Um, I would encourage you to take a look at the toolkit provided by the Arizona Department of Education, um, the website where you should be able to find more material to help you and guide you um, as you move forward in teaching about the very important topic of Native America and genocide. Thank you.